Welcome, welcome. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, we are chatting live today with comic book creators Tina Horn and Kelly Fitzpatrick. Before we begin, I do want to let you guys know um, a little bit about the format. We're going to be doing interview questions and talking about their book, uh, but we're also styling this as an AMA uh, chat. So anything you guys want to ask this creative team, please feel free to put it in the chat throughout our discussion, and I'll be reading questions as they come in. Uh, and now that that is out of the way, uh, let me introduce you to Tina Horn and Kelly Fitzpatrick. Uh, would you guys introduce yourselves to our audience who may not know uh, about you? Kelly, do you want to go first? Um, sure. So I'm Kelly Fitzpatrick. Um, I was honored to be asked on to color um, the second volume of Safe Sex. Um, I've been working in the comic book industry for about nine years as a colorist. Um, and I've colored everything from like your DC Wonder Woman comics to um, indie comics like Yes Roya and all sorts of stuff. I totally no free outs, oh. but I, this is actually, this is not the version that you, this is the old mm -hmm. version, but the, the new one, um, I, I have the old one and I kickstarted the new one even before I had worked with Kelly because it is one of my favorite comics of all time. So anyway, that's an endorsement right there. Are people able to, people who didn't kickstart the new um full color version are they able to pre-order that right now kelly do you happen to know i think I'm like so. out here promoting other people's i think so if they go to like the iron circus website i think they can order it awesome iron circus iron circus is a great publisher in case any of you librarians are, are looking to expand your your indie publishers definitely make sure to check out iron circus. Yeah, i'll just drop that in the chat yes it's like we're all professionals here <laughs> Like I've, I've zoomed a little. <laughs> Once or um, twice. And Tina, uh, I'd love to hear, tell us about yourself. So thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Um, uh, I'm Tina Horn. So I'm the creator and writer of the comic book series, Safe Sex. Um, uh, it's often stylized meant to like clarify but maybe is more confusing as sfsx um it's like easier to type sfsx um but then harder to say it so you should you can you can say it as safe sex but type sfsx it's harder to google safe sex which is good i'm glad people are out here searching <laughs> for information about safe sex for a while because partially um my uh background is in uh, sex education for adults. I think that people thought that I was making like a comic book about like the actual thing, safe sex. It's like, no guys, it's a metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, so this is the first volume. It uh, Image published it in 2020 and also published all of the, um, the single issues that are collected in this book. Um, it's called Safe Sex Protection, available now wherever fine books and comics are sold. Um, or taken out, borrowed from your local library. Uh, and if you don't have it at the library, definitely asking about it is a big deal. And we'll get into this because um, it's a very queer book. It's a very sex positive book. It's definitely a sexually explicit book for adults. It's not erotica or porn, um, but um, uh, you know, it's, it's a science fiction story, but like there's definitely, it's a science fiction story for adults. Um, and let's see, uh, who am I, what do I do? I, I definitely am dealing with drum roll, the common cold right now, that's still around. Um, so I'm just leaning into the, the husky uh, <laughs> voice thing a little bit right now. Um, well, thank you, thank you, um, and lots of fluids. Um, anyway, um, so my background is actually in the sex industry. Um, professional BDSM and um, like queer indie filmmaking. Uh, I am also a journalist. I've written about sexual culture and politics for Rolling Stone, Playboy, Jezebel, Hazlitt, uh, lots of like Cosmo, Glamour, lots of different places. And um, I've written a couple of nonfiction books. And um, my most recent nonfiction book that was published, I was I associate edited a book called We Too, 
sex worker essays about stories uh, about um, about uh, survival, uh, safety and survival. Um, and uh, that is the main editor of that book is Natalie West. That is definitely a book that I think belongs in every library because it's a very diverse group of, in, in every sense of the word, diverse group of um, sex workers writing uh, nonfiction uh, essays um, about their relationship to consent and, and their work. Um, so uh, check that out. And I have a podcast, it's called Why Are People Into That? It's all about, it's a conversation show about sex, kink, gender, and love. And um, I do a lot of both like one-on-one -on -one coaching about sexuality, especially like transgressive sexual subjects like queer identity and, uh, and kink culture um, and polyamory and uh, all, that, all that good stuff. And um, I also consult for film and television and theater. I was the onset tech consultant for the dominatrix scenes in the second season of Pose, um, which was really fun and exciting and hope to do more of that work. And that's me. And the next, okay, so here's my segue. <laughs> the, uh, the next Safe Sex book, um, uh, which Kelly already mentioned, and safe sex terms of service is available for pre-order now wherever fine books and comic books yeah. are sold uh I, i'm actually not sure how that works um in terms of like when libraries are able to acquire it maybe you guys can illuminate that for me um but it uh is officially uh in stores um on november 24th 2021 and um kelly did the colors for it it was our first time working together and the the colors in this book are like something that Kelly brought up like really early when we were working together was like whether or not she could like basically that there was like a we came to a fork in the road where we could either make the colors really literal or really emotive was the word that you used right Kelly mm -hmm. and I was like I was like oh, can you tell me a little bit more about that about what that means in terms of visual art and um and then maybe I'll ask you to describe it, but basically she described it. And I was like, yes, that anytime you're like, should I make this literal or should I make this symbolic, make it symbolic. And the result is like this really surreal, really like luscious, wild world um, uh, in this book that I think is going to like blow the minds of both the people who or fans of this series up until now and people who are discovering this new graphic novel for the first time, which I, I you know, I want people to read the whole, the whole series, but I think that if you just come across volume two, Terms of Service, it really does kind of read as its own like self-contained graphic novel story. Um, but maybe I can pass the mic to Kelly and you can talk a little bit about like what emotive coloring means. Um, well, the way I think I kind of described it, I really, I don't, I remember the conversation, but I don't remember what I said to you, but I think how I kind of described it is, um, a lot of times when I talk about color, I talk about movies and how you, like, you don't even realize you're being like subconsciously like tricked into having these feelings where when we see like blue color palettes, we feel sad. Or when we see like things with heavy yellows and reds, it's it's like action or violence or like, um, it's like when we see colors, we instantly have a, a sort of like emotion attached to a color. So you can either go for like a very literal thing where like grass is green, sky is blue, or you can add in these other layers of color on top of it. Um, to kind of change the scene to either be like happy or somber or like to feel like something kind of attached to that color. And actually though, whenever we start projects out, I tend to like to ask about like, what, what inspires you? What were you thinking about? Like these kind of things And I still have the sticky note. I was, as you're talking, I was looking in front of me on my computer and I still have the sticky note from when we first talked where you mentioned Ash from Alien. And, and then like Hellraiser and neon blues and greens. And I wrote gooey, slimy, wet, like made of clay and something, I can't read my own handwriting, surreal, abject, gross, 
object and sexual, crazy blood, like Cronenberg movies, more emotive palettes is what I wrote. <laughs> so, <laughs> and those are like some of your exact like words that I was just like writing down. Those are great because they're so evocative. That, yeah. Yeah. Even not knowing specifically which colors you picked, just having those notes allows me hearing that to get a very specific visual feel. Yeah. Well, that, that I remember devolved into the, the WAP music video. <laughs> <laughs> and those are like these pinks and greens that are very like almost pastel but like vivid very vivid and so it's like a very specific direction to like head into and that stuff all really helps that's why I say like movies and and comics like especially with color they really can go hand in hand yeah it it was I I have definitely found that um the best way for me to communicate with okay so like I'm actually not like not a very visual person or I haven't always thought of myself as a very visual person and like even as a lifelong comic books fan I think that um I I've noticed since I've become a a comic book maker that like I have a habit from literal childhood of like because I'm so language based of kind of like reading the words in comics and kind of just like letting the imagery um sort of hit me in like an impressionistic way like I'll read an entire like an entire issue of a comic or an entire graphic novel sort of like language wise and kind of like pick up in general what is happening visually on the page and then when I reread it because if you know if I if I like a comic I'm going to read it like many many times um and like the the best ones I read like once a year um and like then once I kind of like understand the the story that came through the language which is like where just like my consciousness goes to then I spend a lot more time with the visuals and like I I honestly don't even know if this is the way of reading comics that I recommend but it's like I said it's like a habit since childhood and sometimes I'll try to like make myself kick it and um it's uh, I'm sure if I really put my mind to it I could um but then again honestly like what you were just saying Kelly like it kind of makes me feel like I I wonder if um if actually like really well made comics the ones that that really like stick with me the like those emotions and those like all of those essentially like subliminal messages that like you are putting in like with colors are like hitting me without me like needing to um they're sort of I I don't know I guess it's almost like like music right it's sort of this Mm -hmm. like symphonic thing that is happening um and I'm sure that people who are more visually inclined are the opposite who are listening to this and are they're like like, what are you talking about? Um, uh, who probably are like looking at like every detail of like layout or movement or composition and and then being like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And then there were some like words on that page. <laughs> <laughs> Kelly, how are you experiencing comics when you when you read them, when you create them? Are you, um, do you have a similar way of taking in that information or do you find an opposing way or what's what's your method? <sighs> I feel like as the longer I've worked in the industry, the more critical I am, (laughs) which like sounds terrible. It's like I lived in Portland for like six years. And when I would go visit my, it's like in the same way, like I I lived in Portland for like six years, I would visit my family who lives in Florida Mm -hmm. and I would bring them coffee. And my parents started calling me a coffee snob because I didn't want to drink Folgers. (laughs) <laughs> and it's like in the same way where you become used to like such good things and you're so, like so for me working in the industry I see such good art and like such good coloring that when I see stuff that I I don't like or I don't think is good I'm like so critical of it now and I feel like a comic snob um but with that being said a lot of the stuff that like I grew up on and the stuff that I return to is in black and white um mm. so which is just like strange as a colorist that like the things that I like grew up on are like your 
like stereotypical goth comics like um so <laughs> like those are the things that I return to but that's also because feel like I'm so busy making comics I don't get to read a lot of them which is really unfortunate um because I read scripts every day and I you know I'm looking at comic art and like helping create it every day but um I don't get around to to reading a lot of it um unless it's primarily kickstarted stuff mm. um but I I a lot of the stuff that brings me into comics is coloring at this point. So that's the first thing I look at and that like combined with the line art and like, those are the things that really draw me in is like, who's if first it's the colorist, then it's, the, then it's who's drawing it and who's writing it is kind of like on the same, on the same level for me. Mm -hmm. And because then I know like from a writing standpoint, and from a drawing standpoint, um, if those two people have worked together for a long time, I know what kind of content and message I'm kind of going to be receiving by reading the book. Um, and um, and so I, I tend to look at like a lot of like new creative teams, kind of seeing like what's fresh, what's coming up in the industry. Um, and so there, I, I kind of view things a little different, I think, when I'm going into reading the comic initially. Um, but then it's just kind of like, I also look at the letter. <laughs> I'm such a nerd, dude. I'm like, I'll look, I'll be like, oh, who lettered this? You know, like, because- and, and, No, I, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, cause like I notice bad lettering, like re it really oh, like yeah. hits you. And I should say that the full art team of Safe Sex Terms of Service out from Image Comics in no on November 24th, 2021 um, is uh, me as the writer creator, G. Romero Johnson, who is, is the illustrator, who is like, maybe we can take a second and talk about G's yes. art is, is like, I, I can't. I, no, like, they're so young. They they are they are a, a rising star in every way. Like yes. that feeling where you are like working with someone and you're like, I am so glad that I got to you before you like you, you know, I'm, I'm going to pay you as much as I can, but you are going to be <laughs> able to demand so much money very soon. And I want that for you. And they um, get eaten up by the industry. <laughs> like yeah, everybody's going to want that, G. Yeah. Like every, everybody, <laughs> like, I'm here to tell you, like, this is your tip. You're going to want to work with G. Romero Johnson. Um, they're incredible. Um, and then uh, Lauren McCubbin is our editor designer um, who just like does incredible work, honestly, like a lot of emotional labor um, with, um, with me and like my ego and my um, like tempering my like Virgo tendencies, um, which Kelly and I have talked about a lot. Um, and, um, and then, uh, <laughs> yes, 100%, 100%. Um, and um, uh, yeah, it, do, it does like so much work that is, um, somebody that was interviewing me uh, recently actually like uh, mentioned the, the sort of idea that like, of like design being invisible, like good design is invisible. And I, I think that that's yeah. true. Although I, I also really like that Lauren's style is like, I don't know if you could quite call it invisible. It's very bold, um, <laughs> but, it, but, but yeah. it's like, it's, um, it, it's bold, but it like bolsters everything. You know what I mean? Um, and, uh, uh, you know, Lauren's design is like the white viscous blood running through our like robot veins that if you <laughs> want to decapitate us would just splatter everywhere. <laughs> Spoilers for 1979 alien. Um, but anyway, um, <laughs> and then, and then, uh, Steve Wands is our letterer, and I, okay. I actually have only ever worked with Steve. I have had the, the great fortune of only working with Steve um, as a letterer. Actually, that's not true. Um, Jen Hickman, um, and I, I, I guess that's not entirely true, but like pri primarily, like far and away, I've worked with Steve, and uh, his work is both like really solid. Um, in the way that, that you need it to be like clarity is very important for a letterer. Um, but then he also like, I like to think that he 
enjoys the like permission that we give him to sort of like lean into stuff that is maybe a little bit more abstract like anytime I say to him in this moment if you want to go nuts go nuts and he always like comes up with something almost like he's like I haven't gotten a chance to like try this out so um I think that I think that his lettering is really stellar and especially like I think that his his sound effects like actually create like a like a sonic texture in the book which like for me as like a very like music based person both like creatively and in terms of what I like that's like very important to me um yes yeah, anyway. amazing amazing team uh I did um, want to ask you because you've worked with with different collaborators when you're working in comics it's not it, sometimes it can be a solo affair but in general it's a very collaborative um effort and you were coming to comics um for the first time with volume one and now you're working on the second volume with you know with new team members what has changed what have you learned and would you go back and uh give any any advice to yourself at the beginning of this this process based on what you know now um about the ins and outs you know i i love collaboration and um i you know like kelly was saying about like all of those all of those movie and music video references i think that i i think that one thing that i have learned as a language based person is like how to communicate with visual artists like like using visuals like i could try to learn you know like what jewel tone means or what um <laughs> you know rule of thirds composition means or all these like technical things but also like if I send <clears throat> if I say like Cardi B Megan the Stallion WAP video <laughs> then it's like we're then we're like on the same literally on the same page you know yeah. and uh, or then we even then that can be like an inspiration for talking about like okay like what what is it about the video besides what it like represents um but then for for me like as a language person and also like very much like a um like a metaphor allegory person I'm like and I guess also like a pop culture I'm I'm a total like sucker for like irreverent pop culture references I you know I'm like a child of the 80s and 90s um uh so I grew up on Animaniacs and Quentin Tarantino so I I'm like uh so, so the idea of like having but th this is this is really fun and I, I do feel to answer your question like this is something that I've learned about collaboration um as a writer with visual artists in this wonderful medium that I love so much of comics is like I can say okay the Cardi B Megan the Stallion video is like highly symbolic of uh <laughs> of like so much that this series represents in terms of like like sexual celebration like definitely like uh like being out and proud about being a sex worker creator in other mediums as, as Cardi B is um uh just like like leaning into uh like you know if you will like a certain kind of like like feminist sex positivity um of just being like super sexually explicit um and like pleasure positive right um and funny and fucking really funny um and then i'm talking talk, talk, talking about the wap video now not my own work but you know you can make a comparison <laughs> um and then so then once we bring up that and i'm super hyped obviously on like the 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 symbolism of the of the reference then it's like well okay so what did they do with with that video um you know they literally made it wet like that video is very, is, is really, really wet. And so, and like, how did they create like visual motifs and landscapes around the idea of being wet? Like some of it is like silly puns, like fountains. And then some of it is like a giant sort of like abstract room where they're like dancing in water, right? So how could we, and, and then it turns out when we look at that room in that video, for anyone who hasn't seen that video, what are you doing with your life? Um, oh, <laughs> um like actually that that room kind of has these almost like tron like um uh like lines in it and then it's like okay so then if we what if we made that room if we thought of that room being in a sort of 
cyberspace, which is like very relevant to the actual like story and characters of safe sex terms of service. And then like all of a sudden we like Kelly has not only like a visual palette, but also like a like a texture palette, which is also something I feel like I've really learned from from working with Kelly is that, yeah, it's about like, is this like our like, are we like color, are we painting by numbers? And is this thing gonna be like blue or is this, this thing gonna be purple? Mm -hmm. But it like, Kelly does these incredible things with like bringing things to life with texture, which maybe you can talk a little bit about Kelly. <laughs> like, like when, when colorists meet, <laughs> this is no joke. We talk about our Photoshop brushes. <laughs> we're like the nerdiest human beings but like you can like you can have paper textures you can have brush textures like there's all these like ways because when you're working digitally everything can just look really like smooth and um like too perfect mm -hmm. and so there's ways that you can imitate more like like traditional mediums like um and so ways of doing that are adding in textures into like the pages and um but by creating that that depth it also brings in like uh more of like an emotional um style into the book like back into the book too um and like another way of talking about it is like you're not going to color uh, like a children's book the same way you're going to color a crime noir book right like mm -hmm. there's different ways of like viewing a, 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 a comic <laughs> like I don't know the right way to say this the atmosphere um, that you're yeah the atmosphere that's the word I'm looking for so like of, mm. of creating like a mood and an atmosphere and um and that's what I was saying like with those pinks and those greens they're uh, from that music video they're very like it's a very specific kind of tone which brought me into looking at like a lot of vaporwave things and mm -hmm. like bringing in those elements because when you're talking about like technology it sort of reminded me a lot of those palettes are like early 90s kind of palettes but a little more refined and so like an like a little modern take on it so mm -hmm. it's it, it I got to actually play with a lot of that stuff and that was super fun because I haven't gotten to do that before <laughs> <laughs> well it's very experimental and it's so successful it's really it's a visual feast and it's fun to read and it's it's sexy and it's adult and it's something that you don't get a lot in the American comics medium just an honest fun adventure cyberpunk that where sex is there and it's fine and that's great and we're cool with it um and I really appreciate that um so glad. unfortunately we're we're running a little short on time so I wanted to give you guys a chance um to tell the audience where they can find you outside of the conference so that they can follow you and your work um so my website is tinahorn.net that's t-i-n-a-h-o-r-n.net i'm on twitter and instagram at t-i-n-a-h-o-r-n-s-a-s-s -S -S, tina horn sass of course um <laughs> and um on the website you can sign up for my newsletter so you're getting updates on everything that is going on with Safe Sex, the comic book, um, as well as the workshops that I teach often on Zoom and um, uh, and and everything else that I'm up to, um, including, I mean, I'm like revving up for a lot of media and events right now with the book coming out. So now would be like a really great time to follow and subscribe and um, you can subscribe to my podcast why are people into that wherever you pod and um and yeah I just hope that um folks will pre-order safe sex terms of service um hopefully at their local book or comic book store or talk to your local library um you know we didn't get a, much of a chance to talk about this but like maybe you are aware that there is a lot of um, censorship and um, even just like hesitance um, around uh, having books in libraries that uh, either, that, you know, 
to be clear, our book is very sexually explicit, but even just the the themes of um, queer relationships and and cultures are often just blanketly seen as like inappropriate. Um, and it's I know that libraries have been such an important place for me to discover and like learn about culture and pleasure and community and and like all different kinds of like storytelling and education. Um, so I hope that that people will advocate for uh, for books like ours um, to be at their libraries. I think totally. that librarians can definitely uh, talk to their distributors about getting this book. Just to jump in before Kelly, I'm so sorry. Um, before I had a couple of great question or co questions and comments that I wanted to share with you. Um, Missa, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. They said, uh, especially and unfortunately rare uh, when sex workers are at the helm of stories that involve sex work. Thanks so much for being here and making this available, y'all. Thank you. Oh, and thank you for, for bringing that up. And John Mayer says that their academic library is lucky to avoid the issue of censorship and that Safe Sex is a great book. Uh, and he also says it is important for their students to learn about consent. So I just wanted to jump in there and Kelly, please let us know where we can follow you. Um, <laughs> I'm at Wasted Wings on Twitter and Instagram. Um, where you'll also find my illustration work. I'm, my website is also Kelly F Empire. It's a pun, empire.com. <laughs> um, and you can find um, the comics I've worked on there and um, more of my illustration work too. Thank you so much. Thank you guys for coming and chatting with us today. I'm sorry that we did not have more time to explore this, but I do wanna make sure that the librarians who are with us today know that you can reach out to Image Comics to set up virtual events and chats with our creators. And please let your colleagues know that we are going to um, archive and save this chat, both within the booth itself for the next few months and on the Image Comics YouTube channel. So if anybody missed it or you'd like to watch it again, please check us out there. Thank you so much, guys. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks again for coming out. Enjoy thank the you. rest of the conference and thank you so much for having us. All right, feel better, Tina. And thank you, Kelly. Thank Thanks. you so much. Bye. Have a good day, guys. Bye.